There he is. You got it. Booyah. You got it. All right. Here we go. Um, uh, raise your hand if you know where this spot is in this title picture. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is right above St. Anthony uh, Falls. Uh, right in downtown Minneapolis. That is one of my, the, the guy crouching in the corner here. I got to move the screen. Boop. Move Bob out of the way. Uh, that dude there, his name is Hero, and he is stalking the flats of the urban Mississippi. Um, right on the tip of the rock point there, there's about a 15 uh, pound carp tailing in about a foot of water. So uh, he made three casts on it and it spooked <laughs> on the last cast, of course. Uh, they're very finicky fish, but it's just a really cool fishery. Um, and I, I'm excited to share it with you. So here we go back to this uh, 72 miles of it are federally uh, designated and protected from uh, Dayton, Minnesota, the mouth of the Crow River, all the way down past Hastings uh, to the Vermilion River backwaters. Um, it was established in 1988 and it's classified as a national river. Uh, it's, it has recreation area in the name, but it's not technically a designated or classified recreation area. Um, uh, but as a national river, it's only one of four. That's pretty dang cool. Uh, this is a partnership park. So the, the federal government or the National Park Service only actually owns about uh, 70 acres of this whole 72 mile stretch. The rest of it is a blend of county, city, state land, um, as well as private residences and business as well. And the idea of this partnership is that all these different entities work together to oversee and manage this uh, watershed, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is the only uh, uh, national park site that is solely dedicated uh, for the Mississippi. That's kind of interesting. Um, and this, this a park contains a vast amount of cultural, ecological, and historical uh, meaning for our area, especially, but also um, stuff for national significance as well. So, very cool place. Here's a map for you. I'm a visual person. Uh, so, get out of here, bar. So, up on the top of the screen, that black line with the green, uh, that is River Mile 8. 179. Um, that's what the National Park uh, from this first section is designated as wild and scenic uh, through the state. Um, so that goes from the Crow River down to uh, Banfill Island in Brooklyn Park. Uh, the next section after that goes through uh, Brooklyn Park, Fridley, Minneapolis. Um, they call that the Urban River section. That's from River Mile 862 to 852 um, and that starts from or that ends rather at um, uh, Lock and Dam, the lower St. Anthony Lock and Dam uh, just past St. Anthony Falls. Um, at that point we uh, enter the gorge and this is the only gorge on the whole Mississippi River which means it's narrow and it's really tall um, and it's beautiful in there and the fishing is awesome. Uh, but uh, it's a really tip, a kind of a shorter section, uh, but that ends just past uh, Pike Island at the mouth of the Minnesota River at Fort Snelling State Park. Um, at that point, the river widens. There's still some tall bluffs, but as you go through um, uh, downtown St. Paul, uh, it's a lot of barge traffic still. Uh, so they're calling it the Working River. Um, that's from the, Minis the mouth of the Minnesota all the way to Pig's Eye Lake. You guys know where that is? If you're driving down over the bridge on 52, um, it's kind of just around the, the river bend from there. It's a huge estuary. Really cool. Uh, and then the final part, move this bar here for you so you can see, uh, is the floodplains. And uh, basically from Pig's Eye Lake, which is kind of the start of it, all the way down to the backwaters of uh, the Vermilion River past Hastings. All of that is just huge floodplain riparian area. Um, and if you've ever driven through there, end of April through June, uh, most of the time, those woods that time of the year are flooded under feet of water. It's really cool habitat. 
Um, so kind of like the closest thing we get here to like mangrove fishing in Minnesota. It's kind of neat. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, go through each of these sections, tell you what it's like, uh, where you should fish, what you should fish with, and then I'll show you all the cool fish pictures. Sound good? All right, here we go. We're here for the fish. Loading. Show of hands, has anyone fished this area before? Few of us, all right, couple. Nice, I can't see Zoom, but I'm sure there's some crazy folks out there. There we go. All right, so whoop, the wild and scenics. Uh, you can, what do you got? Uh, below the nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. then, uh, Monticello, yes, yeah. Apparently there was a government ruling that the water has to be cooler. And so they're building a chamber that will reduce the temperature of the water release into the river. Really? And so that's going to produce, you know, obviously the mayfly hatches and all the other. Yeah. Oh, dang. I haven't heard about that. Yeah. No, I haven't heard that. Um, that's quite a ways outside of this section. Um, but that's new. That'll be interesting to see how that affects. So he was bringing up how the nuclear power plant in Monticello uh, is going to be dropping the temps. And if you want a really cool open water fishing spot before trout season, winter trout season opens up, uh, the nuke plant in Monticello is a cool spot. It's not secret at all, <laughs> uh, but it's really, really cool. All right. So the wild and scenic section, uh, that top portion from the Crow River down to uh, the island Brooklyn Park, that is all state wild and scenic designated. There's no uh, federal property up there. Um, primarily, it's forested banks with residential suburban homes, uh, a couple smaller towns that you'll see. Um, there's some really cool uh, uh, braided channels and islands, um, especially down towards Champlain and below uh, the Coon Rapids Dam. Um, and those are kind of the best access points as well. Um, there's great riffle run. Uh, pool structure in there. Uh, very, really easy to float. So if you're in a canoe, drift boat, motorboat, whatever, you can get all those in there for relatively easily. Um, but in lower water, it's like awesome wading as well. Uh, fishing it. Here we go. That's my buddy Ben uh, fishing up in the wild and scenic part holding a cool little bass that guy ate a popper uh, but this section is awesome bass fishing it's all cobble rock mixed with sand it's really good habitat for them um, but you can also have the opportunity to catch a lot of northern pike and walleye channel catfish uh, my favorite common carp um, and even a few muskies in there um, best flies your general run-of-the-mill streamer bait fish and crayfish imitations. Those are going to work anytime, all the time. Uh, um, uh, poppers and, and divers and things like that work uh, peak summer into early fall. Um, and what you're going to look for when you're fishing this river, you think of it as a super big trout stream. Bass will sit, and a lot of our fish will sit in the same kind of structure that trout will in a stream. They're looking for eddies, they're looking for hard structure like boulders, logs, things like that. Um, uh, if you can pound the banks, do it. That's where they are. You ever notice when people on shore are fishing, they're always casting out as far as they can, and then everyone in boats trying to cast right onto bank. The fish are somewhere in between there, so if you can hit that zone, you're probably going to catch something. Uh, on the river here, pound the banks. Uh, fish are looking for frogs and minnow schools, things like that. Um, if it's uh, look later in the season or low water, look for uh, deeper submerged structure, drop offs, boulders. Uh, submerged weeds, especially weeds give off oxygen. Late summer fish need that oxygen because uh, the water gets super warm. Uh, but again, best areas to go are those island chains uh, near Champlain and Dayton area. There's a cool county park um, and then the county park right below uh, Coon Rapids Dam is really good. Here's the good stuff. 
but uh boom uh we've got uh these are all clients of mine and myself um lots of really good sized bass uh catfish on the fly what yeah super fun um uh the guy on the bottom here this was probably the coolest double of my life uh with clients uh but these are our this is actually amber taylor she'll be at our next meeting and so should you um and our educator for the trout in the classroom program jim uh jim this was like last cast of the day we got it. This is our last spot, last cast. Uh, Amber first hooks up on the on the the little smallie, and then uh, Jim like hooks up on this thing, and it's pulling us up river, down river, across river. It takes like five minutes to pull this thing in. It's just big and round. It was so cool. It was a huge carp. Uh, so in low water, especially in the Mississippi, uh, um, carp will root up crayfish and other macro invertebrates from the bottom and they make a big dust cloud and bass have learned oh hey that's free food so you'll get schools of bass following around carp picking up the scraps that they uh, spit up so these sorts of doubles do happen um, early season you can also get walleye on flies pretty easily when the water is up high they're all in the same eddies as the bass and everybody else too so um, super cool spot all right there we go uh so the next one the urban sections so we're leaving brooklyn park now heading in towards downtown minneapolis you might know 694 bridge lowry bridge um boom island things like that stone arch bridge this is kind of the section that uh is made up in this area um uh so this goes this will end just past saint anthony falls this section uh, there's several at the start, kind of around uh, 694 area. There are several islands, a few riffles, cool kind of river bottom and lower flows up there. After uh, Dowling Avenue, um, that was the top of the old barge traffic. Um, so the Army Corps for years have maintained a, a nine to 15 foot dredged channel mid river. Um, so after Dowling, there's like a sweet little ledge and then it's just deep the whole way through the middle um, in this old dredged out area. Um, you'll also be fishing a lot of old industrial things, old barge docks and concrete plants. And uh, you can float by Psycho Susie's. That's pretty cool. Sometimes they'll honk a foghorn at you. Um, uh, that's pretty sweet. Um, but this is a I, this is my personal favorite section to fish on this river because um, you get to be, you kind of get to bring some hubris to it. Uh, you'll be you'll be casting flies next to flip flops and bottles floating in the water, and you'll catch a twenty inch bass right next to a a, a, a plastic bag or something. It's really cool. Um, uh, or casting a lot of the old barge docks and, and landings have just straight sheet metal. And it's just a straight six foot, eight foot drop off of bank. And you have to like flick your poppers right into these little slits in the metal. And each little slit will have a one or two bass sitting in there. Um, it's, it's kind of an amusement park almost of fly fishing. I think it's super fun. Um, uh, because of the dredging, um, Waiting access isn't fantastic in this section. Uh, the, um, uh, there are certainly areas to, to wade. You can't go out like mid river and do it. Um, but uh, once water, especially in low water conditions, there are some really sweet wading sections, especially Stone Arch Bridge area. Nicollet Island. Um, Nicollet Island, there are some rock outcroppings you kind of can hop along. A better spot, I would say, would be Boom Island, just north of there. Um, that has really good access in lower, lower water. Uh, yeah, so this is my personal favorite. Same sort of deal. You're going to catch everything in its uncle uh, in this river section. Um, uh, this is mostly rough fish territory. So think uh, 
uh, uh, buffalo, carp, various sucker species, things like that. But there are also really good catfish, smallmouth bass, rumored to be huge muskies, decent sized pike, um, walleye. We've caught everything in there. It's really, you know, you don't know what's going to eat your fly. That's half the fun. So you're skipping things off of flip flops and barge docks and you don't know what's biting your fly. It's really cool. Um, same sort of standard deal. Uh, crayfish imitations and minnows work all the time. If you want to target some of the rough fish, use uh, your, your favorite trout nymphs. Uh, big hare's ears, big pheasant tails. Um, uh, they're, they're all just eating little, little mayflies and stoneflies in here. And there are fantastic populations of macro invertebrates in here. Stoneflies, mayflies, caddis, we get all those same hatches that we see on the trout streams, um, sometimes in massive proportions. Um, yeah, wading can be a little sketchy though. Just be mindful of how far you're going away from the shore, how deep you're going, um, and then water levels as well. Because it's all just channelized and straight, the current can get, get going pretty quick through there in high flows. Here's the pictures. Look at that. Uh, so we've got common carp. That's the Stone Arch Bridge, freshwater drum channel catfish uh we've got the uh the one in the bottom right is uh a, a big mouth buffalo and this one is uh, in father hennepin bluffs park um, somebody's playing guitar uh, <laughs> uh, someone over uh, on the creek there's a, a creek and then a different outflow. And in the late summer, it's like six inches deep. And buffalo will migrate to stream inflows. Uh, they need a lot of oxygen. Um, so they'll go up these little creeks. And uh, we saw that guy like a porpoise with his back out of the water, swimming up a riffle like a salmon. It was really cool. And then we got him just swinging soft tackles. He found a little pocket, putting the soft tackle in there. Um, it was sweet. Uh, the carp on the bottom, on the other corner, that's called a mirror carp. Those are actually pretty rare. They're a, uh, it's a, like a mutation. Um, you can see the scale differences between the one in the top corner and the one on the bottom there. The mirror, mirror carp will get really cool shaped and splotching uh, scales. So if you catch that, that's like, whoa, big deal in carp land. All right. Moving on. There it is. Now we get to the gorge. This is one of the uh, coolest parts of this river section because it is so uh, rare. It's the only gorge on the river. Um, and hey, who's ever playing guitar? Could you mute real quick? The sound is even squeezy. Could you please mute? Yeah, he's muted now. Sorry. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> we loved the we loved it, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll have live music after everyone. Uh so yeah, the gorge. This is really cool. Um after the lower St. Anthony Dam. Uh past the U of M campus on the East Bank, West Bank, you're past downtown now. Um, uh, this is like huge limestone bluffs going through. It's about a nine mile section. Um, access is unfortunately pretty difficult to get into. Um, there's, there's a few waiting areas, not very many. Um, and the only like boat access you get is some um, uh, carry down access at Bohemian Flats Park. And then you gotta go all the way down, all the way through Ford Dam and that lock, hopefully it's open. And then you gotta take out at Hidden Falls uh, uh, down towards St. Paul. Um, and conversely, if you're in a motorboat, you gotta enter at Hidden Falls, go through the lock and then you can get into the gorge. Um, but Super fascinating history, geological uh, stuff, e ecology stuff in there. 
Um, it's a really fascinating piece of piece of water. Uh, doesn't get a lot of fishing pressure because there's just not that much access to it. Um, there are weightable sections in lower water, uh, but really it is best from a boat if you're able or willing to, to try that. Uh, really good bass in there because um, the whole thing is just cobble limestone. <laughs> uh, it's all limestone cliff on the St. Paul side, Minneapolis side's a little shallower, sandier with logs. Um, uh, one of the interesting things uh, uh, my team discovered this season was that we see all these beautiful rocks and we're like, oh, you know, foamy, scuzzy eddies, like fish heaven, bass heaven. Uh, all, most of the bass, at least this season with really low water, were all on the weedy, sandy log, zero current side. Um, but like once you were finding them, it was, they will throw a popper, throw whatever streamer, you would catch 10, 15 of them off of one log jam. Um, and you'd row to the next one and Boom, 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 boom. Uh, so really interesting fishing. Um, it was important in this section too, and kind of this whole urban section, anywhere there's water coming in, that obviously generates oxygen and fish like that, um, especially through the gorge here too. There are some springs that trickle in and little tiny spring creeks, uh, uh, but anywhere there's water coming in, that would concentrate fish as well. And the really cool thing below Ford Dam is the pool to fishing regulations. And that, um, so you know, we're like Minnehaha Creek flows in right there, that's Ford Dam. So everything from Ford Dam all the way down to Hastings Dam, that's all pool two. And that whole section of river is open to year round catch and release fishing for walleye, sauger, and large and smallmouth bass on top of all the other species. Um, you can't do pike, you can't do muskies, uh, but you got catfish, white bass, uh, everybody else in there, uh, carp and everyone else, um, really cool. But if you get a hankering and it's like a 70 degree day in April or something, get your, go, go wait around or get your boat out and uh, try to find some fish. Here's what's in there, goo -goo uh, Again, carp, um, uh, there is a, a phenomena that happens called the mulberry hatch. You all know mulberry trees and mulberries. They look like little purple raspberries. Um, so uh, mostly this happens Madison area and further south, but we, we're starting to see it here uh, mid like June, early July when the mulberries are on the trees and start falling. Um, catfish, carp, uh, I haven't seen bass, but for sure suckers, catfish, carp will start eating these berries and they will get a sugar rush <laughs> from all these fermented mulberries. Um, they fight twice as hard. So you're using like a giant purple piece of foam or deer hair or something. You just splat it on the water right under one of these trees and you'll just get a 10 pound catfish or carp slurping it up. It is wild. Um, so that's a really cool thing in the gorge because those trees are overhanging the river in that point. Um, we, we do see some of that. The working river, so now we're uh, leaving the gorge, valleys spreading out a little bit, still some high sides, you know, like High Bridge and St. Paul. Um, uh, we're passing Pike Island, Watergate Marina. Uh, we're, we're hitting the mouth of the Minnesota and going through downtown St. Paul. Um, there's still some limestone outcroppings, especially like by Lilydale um, before uh, downtown St. Paul, and those can be really good for fishing. Um, otherwise, once you get past High Bridge, it gets an, really industrial again. Lots of riprap banks, really steep riprap banks. Um, very, very channelized. They have still a lot of barge traffic and big boat traffic through there. Um, there can be good fishing um, along some of the, the, the rip wrapping and log jams and, and cliff faces, um, but it's very big water. You need a boat for it. Um, sometimes you got to use full intermediates or sinking lines for it, um, uh, but you can get in there. 
no one's fishing it because of that. <laughs> uh, so if you can get in there, you can get some pretty good fishing. Um, uh, limited access with the boat ramps. Lilydale is free. And then I think the next one, there might be mm -hmm. one at Harriet Island, but I think you have to pay a fee for that one. Um, so it's a private marina. And then the next one would be the 494 bridge uh, past Pig's Eye Lake. There it is. Um, this is a really cool section in the spring. Like I mentioned, the pool two reg, uh, fishing regulations are all through this section. Uh, if you can, and you got a boat or something, um, one of the coolest fishing opportunities in the spring, I feel, is the white bass. They're like little mini striped bass. Um, and they're native to the, to the river here. Uh, but these things sit in, in good sized schools and they will chase around bait fish and they'll crash and, you know, rage on the surface on, on bait balls of bait fish. And you can throw a white woolly bugger or whatever white streamer into that, into that thrashing and crashing of water um, and, and get these cool little, you know, they don't, they're not huge like, like uh, striped bass and on the Atlantic, but you can get them up to two, three pounds. Um, they fight really good, but it's just awesome to see that uh, 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 explosion on the surface. Um, come summer, uh, late spring through the summer, target those cliff faces or any of those really big eddies. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's really not very good waiting. You might be able to do some off of Pike Island at Fort Snelling or Harriet Island right in downtown uh, St. Paul. Um, but this is pretty much boat water uh, through this section and, and the next one. Um, the next one is the floodplain lakes and backwaters, all of our cool estuaries. Um, our, our bluffs begin to leave us in this area. Our, our river uh, valley is really wide um, and we get into uh, seasonal uh, uh, riparian zones and flooding areas. Um, if you go to these in the spring, you can get into these just magical backwaters, little sloughs, little lakes, um, and all of those fish, use those for spawning areas. Uh, you name it, fish species, they're all up in there in the spring. Um, uh, as the summer progresses, those get really shallow and hard to access. You probably could with a kayak still. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend wading in there. It's all super silty for the most part, um, but not impossible. Access wise, not, there's a couple of parks, but the, most of the parks have really steep riprap banks. There's still a lot of barge traffic going through here. Um, there are a couple of, of, of uh, boat ramps though that could be used. There he is, big old carp sucking on a hex nymph of all things. We do get the hexagenia mayfly hatch in here um, and everybody and their uncle eats them. It's pretty sweet. Uh, but yeah, we can still do the pool two fishing regulations. Uh, spring and the early summer are the best. Um, it's like our, our little Florida Everglades in there. Um, I would highly recommend checking out Pig's Eye Lake um, and Spring Lake closer towards um, Hastings. Uh, if you're fishing either of them, just be really careful. If you're in there with a prop, motor prop, just be careful of any stumps or old wing dams. Um, get a good river map. It shows you where all those things are. Um, but otherwise, you can look for um, the eddies along the riprap. If it's a good, fast eddy that's a little bit deeper, um, right along the rocks, those will hold a couple smallmouth in them for sure. Um, I've seen gar in there. I've seen all sorts of wild fish, um, which are catchable. This is world famous Robert Hawkins, owner of Bob Mitchell's. This is up uh, on a trip we did together up on Pig's Eye Lake a few years ago. Um, and literally just like we're on his motorboat, it's like a flat skiff and you're seeing these <laughs> like 10 to 20, 30 pound fish just sitting in there, <laughs> their backs out of the water, they're munching on leaves or whatever, and you can just sneak up on them and uh, plop a fly on there. Um, he's also holding a pretty good sized channel catfish. That guy also ate a hexagenia nymph that was just dead drifting in, uh, in some current. Um, 
pretty amazing fishery in there. Okay, when you should fish uh, and where you should fish, a lot of it's determined by water temperature um, and water uh, levels. Um, so in the springtime, it's gonna be really cold, probably pretty high. Um, fish are lazy, never forget that. Just like us on a Sunday afternoon, they just wanna sit there and eat out of a bag of chips. Don't we all, right? Uh, so look for those lazy spots. Um, find the areas that are outside of the main current, especially during runoff. Um, so that's going to be your flooded backwaters, or uh, if there's any islands that become submerged or uh, uh, riparian areas, um, all those will be really good spots for fish to get out of the fast stuff so they can be lazy, maybe find a minnow or a crayfish or an earthworm. Um, they'll probably spawn up in there too. Uh, come early and into the midsummer um, on the Mississippi, generally runoff will taper out by mid to late June. Depends how much snow we get up north, obviously, and then a, a, how wet of a spring we have. Um, and uh, once those waters start to drop, that's when we can start doing more wading around in like the wild and scenic or the urban sections. Um, and uh, during runoff, uh, that water is going to be really turbid. Visibility is not going to be a thing. Um, but as obviously as that drops, um, it will uh, be surprisingly clear. Uh, come midsummer, some really fun opportunities for fishing are the cottonwood seeds. You know, like the, the big blizzards in June, we get of the white fuzzy seeds. Uh, Carp, buffalo, suckers, just slurp up that stuff. Super fun, just tie on like a little white, uh, like a, a, a pale morning dun or a little parachute atoms and cast it onto a mat of cottonwood seeds where a fish might be slurping nearby, you can catch one on that. Um, we'll also, like I mentioned, the mulberries, that's usually June or July. And then the, uh, the white Miller mayfly hatch. Have you guys seen these things before? Dude. It is insane. Um, so these guys are usually late July, early August. Uh, they hatch right at sunset to dark and it literally looks like a blizzard of mayflies. Um, and you'll get everything, smallies, uh, carp, everybody uh, rising to these bugs. But these mayflies are really interesting because uh, most all mayflies have two adult phases. And most mayflies, it takes them a bit of time to get between those phases, not the white millers. They will literally pop out of the water, land all over you, and within seconds, they, they hatch into their, um, their spinner phase, and then they go up and do their business up in the sky. So the spinner fall happens very, very quickly after they initially start hatching, uh, which is why it's really fun stay out there right at sunset by the time it's dark everybody's hitting stuff on surface uh, very fun and then late summer into the fall the river gets really low uh, this the last two or three years we've had historically low water levels um, I think last summer it was the lowest it's been in 40 years um, which is it doesn't it, it doesn't affect the warm water fish as much as it would like a, on a trout stream so they're okay with it uh, but it's probably not a good trend to, to become normal. Uh, so hopefully we get more water. Um, but this is like when uh, the, the title slide, that was in September uh, with Hero crouching, fishing of the flats right in downtown. Um, the water is gin clear, like a trout stream. There's aquatic vegetation. You can see the schools of fish moving around. It's all sight fishing. It's really, really fun. Um, with those lower uh, flows, they, they expose the clumps of rocks and cool shelves and riffles and things. So it becomes more technical like trout fishing too. Um, so late summer, early fall is very fun. As fall progresses, temps drop again, uh, those fish will begin to move deeper and become lethargic again. But um, depending on the fall, you can easily fish here uh, in through October. So this is some really cool stuff. Uh, we all know the, the, the free the Kinney taking out the dam over there. Uh, we're actually going through the same process right here in downtown Minneapolis uh, with the three dams there. 
really interesting stuff. Um, uh, and there's a few groups that are kind of overseeing the river through here. Uh, Friends in the Mississippi, Great River Greening, uh, the MWMO, uh, and several others. They're focusing on land acquisition and restoration, um, uh, clean water and public access advocacy because we do need better access out there. Um, they're watching construction projects and new development projects, uh, making sure the river gets priority. Lots of water quality data collecting. Um, uh, invasive species is a big thing, especially the silver carp um, that are moving their way up. I think they've found a few of them in Lake Pepin now, um, and obviously community outreach. At this point, I've I've been talking with all these groups and wanting to do more with these groups and anglers just aren't on their radar. Um, so um, I would, I would, you know, it's a personal project of mine uh, to find more ways for our community to uh, get more involved with this uh, decision-making process in a lot of these projects. Cause we should, uh, but here we go. Here's the big project, the big hot topic for this section, the lock and dam removal. Dang. Uh, so we all probably know in 2015, Congress closed the upper St. Anthony Lock and Dam. So you know the one right below St. Anthony Falls, that one is closed, never opening again. Uh, no more barge traffic, no more recreational use. It is solid closed. Uh, the reason why they did that is to, that is the northernmost boundary they want silver carp to go, uh, which are the jumping ones we've all seen on YouTube. Those guys are bad because they're filter feeders. They take out the plankton and the really basic uh, food chain stuff. And it's a cascading effect from there. Uh, so uh, Congress said no further in St. Anthony Falls, uh, which is good, which is a, a, a good thing to do. Uh, uh, because on top of that, all of the locks in Minneapolis and St. Paul now no longer serve barge traffic. Um, all the barges stop in St. Paul. There's a huge, there's a couple of really big terminals around uh, Pig's Eye Lake and Spring Lake. And uh, otherwise they'll all turn up the Minnesota River, go towards Chaska, Burnsville, Savage, uh, spots like that. Uh, so as a result, they're not serving their um, authorized uses anymore. And the Army Corps has started uh, two disp disposition studies, which they're doing, uh, are just starting now for the Kinney as well. Uh, so very similar process going on in tandem here. Um, but they are studying all three locks and dams in Minneapolis. So that will be Upper St. Anthony, Lower St. Anthony, and Lock and Dam Number 1, also called Ford Dam, down by Minnehaha Creek uh, Falls there. Uh, so here we go. So the upper uh, one closed 2015. This one actually serves some really important uses for us and for the river. This one actually controls the water levels um, all above Minneapolis. And that's important because that's where most of the Twin Cities gets their drinking water. <laughs> uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, both have water intakes up around Banfield Island and 694. Um, so this one, uh, obviously controls water levels to maintain the minimum so that they can keep sucking water out of there. Um, it does generate a little bit of hydroelectric power, not a crazy amount, uh, but this uh, study was started a few years ago um, and it's now almost done. And the Army Corps is wanting to divest its ownership to a third party, um, which is, I don't know, uh, could be interesting, might be bad might be good we don't really know because the third party hasn't been named yet and several of those nonprofit groups I mentioned earlier are like well because we don't know who they are are they going to keep maintaining this dam because uh, it's due for some pretty important maintenance stuff um, and uh, will they keep you know the water levels where they should be for all the intakes and river ecology and everything like that to be determined uh, the really exciting ones, though, are the Lower St. Anthony Dam uh, uh, and Ford Dam. 
And this disposition study is just getting going. These were these are merely here to help barges get up and down and through the gorge and up, used to be up above Minneapolis to North Minneapolis, uh, where we can now catch hella smallies off the old steel walls in there. Um, this one also generates a little bit of uh, hydroelectric. You can get through there on super limited hours and uh, uh, time frames if you want to get a boat up there. I personally have never seen a recreational boat up below Stone Arch Bridge. Um, there is a steamboat that does interesting tours that'll go up through there. But that's the only boat I've ever seen uh, in between the falls and this dam. Um, and so the study that is just starting is looking at uh, will the Army Corps maintain it as it is? They'll keep ownership and they'll just keep the dam, fix you know any huge stuff that needs to be done. Um, and that's you know hunky dory. Two, they'll take it out and restore the river section. That'd be sweet. Um, or again, divest it to a third party. Uh, so those are just the options that they're studying and they're looking at the costs and benefits of all those options. Removal would be really interesting because uh, this would open up everything from the falls down. <laughs> it would reconnect like almost 40 miles of river um, and open all that up to fish migration. Um, uh, uh, hopefully, you know, funding and all that, they could uh, redo the river bottom, make good spawning habitat again. That'd be really interesting. However, that would be exceedingly expensive and you'd probably have to fix all the bridges and all the other stuff. Um, admittedly, a lot of these nonprofits I showed, they also don't have a formal stance on whether dams should be taken out or not. They're also waiting for the studies to get done because this is a major deal. If this project happened, this would be the largest river restoration and dam removal project in an urban area, period. That'd be like crazy. Uh, lock and dam number one or four dam. Uh, as it sit, sits now, this is an awesome, awesome fishing spot. You see all those big foam uh, eddies up there below the dam, all the rock piles up there. In low water, you can bring a boat up to the tail end of this island. You can see where the concrete ends on the entryway. You can't bring a, a, a boat past that point but you can park on the island and walk up there. Um, and everyone and their uncle fish wise is hanging out below this dam. And it's because it's pool two, uh, really loose fishing regulations. It's super fun. Uh, but also uh, this one was just designed to move barges up and down the river. It does still serve recreational users um, uh, on a very uh, 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 strict or limited basis. I believe this year it was only on the weekends from like nine to four. Um, and I think you even had to call ahead um, to, to let them know you were coming. But um, uh, interesting spot for sure. Right below all that, that's where Minnehaha Creek flows in. That's a great fishing spot too. Uh, this one also puts out a little bit of hydroelectric power, um, but uh, the, the Army Corps is also looking at removing this one. And again, that would open up 39, 40 miles of river. Um, very interesting. So what are some of the costs and benefits to these projects? Um, obviously the costs, it's going to be a lot of money uh, to not only remove them, but to fix up any existing infrastructure in there and to restore the river bottom. Um, that's a lot, a lot of money. And uh, the, both the Lower St. Anthony and uh, the Ford dams do produce a, a little bit of hydroelectrics. We would lose that. Everyone's saying that it wouldn't be hard to replace it though uh, with other means. Um, and the existing recreational groups in the gorge, there's the U of M rowing team and then there's the Minneapolis rowing club. Uh, those guys would have to move because <laughs> uh, if you took out those dams, um, it would uh, restore all of the rapids and riffles and it, it's not deep in there historically. It's really rocking and rolling cool white water. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but the good things, we'd get 30, uh, 39, 40 miles of river back together. That is huge for migrating fish and spawning fish. Uh, this river does have 
a, a small population of lake sturgeon and paddlefish. And these fish require a huge migrational range to spawn with. Um, and it hasn't been great lately because it's all chopped up by these dams. Uh, but bass as well, um, they've tracked, there was a study a long time ago, just tracking the movement of the bass up in the Mon Monticello area. And even those guys moved a whole crazy bunch. Um, so opening up rivers does allow fish migration and better spawning. Um, it would naturalize the river, the rapids would be back, the riparian flooding zones would be back, and we'd get new opportunities for recreation, rafting, more fishing, more better public access. It could be cool, uh, cool but expensive. Ultimately, these things take years and Congress gets the final say. So time will tell. If you want to follow it, the Friends of the Mississippi group has been doing an awesome job of tracking every process. Um, so definitely follow them along. In short, my friends, why fish this section of river? Um, I feel it offers one of the most unique fishing opportunities in the region, uh, especially for our native fish. We're Trout Unlimited. We're a big native fish supporting group, right? Um, so if you want to catch freshwater drum, small or largemouth buffalo, uh, catfish, quillbacks, any number of these awesome uh, red horse, uh, awesome sucker species, uh, these guys are thriving in this section. They're really hard to catch and a lot of them grow to like 10, 20 pounds. <laughs> um, in order to catch them, it's all sight fishing too, which is super fun. Uh, not to mention the bass, pike, other game species that are in there. Um, and uh, it's a really important ecological and migration route uh, for a lot of bird species. Um, one of my favorite bird sightings was a peregrine falcon underneath the Lowry Bridge. He took out a duck. <laughs> he was picking it apart on the Lowry Bridge. It was so cool. But there's a, several heron rookeries up there. There's deer and beavers and coyotes all over the place. It's really cool to see nature thriving um, right in the heart of the city here in suburbia. Um, it's a nice reminder. You don't have to drive an hour, two, three, four hours to feel like you're in nature. Uh, it's right in our backyards. And this is truly our home water. Our cities, none of us would be here without this river or that waterfall. That's why we're all here. Um, and uh, it does deserve that sort of recognition and protection um, and better access for sure. Um, and I'm excited for us as anglers to have a bigger voice at these tables because there's some pretty big topics happening right now. Uh, especially with those dam uh, removal things. Uh, but if you would like to get out there, we've got a couple cool ways to do so. Um, our guiding uh, company, Fishing for All, we provide those handy dandy wade and float trips through that whole section. Uh, you can take a picture of that screen there. I've got brochures up on the table. Uh, feel free, all those go to rec to me. So if you just want to call and ask about carp or something, I'm here for you. Um, another thing is Twin Cities Carp Unlimited. If you were, this will test how dedicated of members you are. I believe it was last April Fools, we sent you all an email about the Kinney Dam removal, jokingly that we were changing our identity to Twin Cities Carp Unlimited. And I had my picture holding the carp all proud and happy. Well, it's happening, people. We have started a social fishing group uh, called Twin Cities Carp Unlimited to highlight all these awesome species in our backyards and obviously the fisheries. Um, and this group is going to be hosting Carpicide, uh, which used to be out of Mend Provisions Fly Shop. Uh, we're taking it over from them and growing it substantially, uh, but it is a carp fly fishing tournament for the metro area, as well as a big party up at Forgotten Star Brewery, live music, food trucks, bringing it together for the carp. It'll be super cool. Uh, but otherwise, that's all I've got for my uh, slides here. Hope you were learning stuff, had fun, and happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Evan. We're going to, uh, if it's okay, the folks that are on Zoom, go ahead and start putting your questions in the chat, uh, and I'll read them to Evan. And once we finish with the Zoom folks, we'll move to the in-person audience. 
Um, we already do have a couple of questions, actually, Evan. Uh, Lee Still, I think you might have asked, uh, answered his question already, but he was wondering if you ever take a canoe through the lock, and I think he was specifically referring to the Ford Dam lock. You can uh, take a canoe through there. They have little hand ropes for you on the walls. Um, uh, you might have to call ahead, but once you get in there, you pull a cord for a horn that alerts the, the lock operator that you're there, and they'll toot their horn back a couple times. They'll shut the doors, and you just hold onto this rope, and you'll either go up or down uh, with the water. Super fun process. A <laughs> little scary in a canoe, but uh, uh, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Yeah, just wear a life jacket, okay? I know the peanut gallery is like, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> we didn't see any, we didn't see any uh, photos of that happening. So you'll, you'll have to send yeah. a photo. <laughs> yeah. That's on uh, YouTube. I'm sure. Yeah. Lee was also saying, uh, asking what could I expect to catch at the path leading to the Mississippi at Spring Lake park? I've yeah. wondered what lurks around that eddy and the surrounding backwater dead trees. It, you could catch basically any everything except for trout and salmon. Um, there's literally everybody out there. If it's early season, um, early season down there, you'll have more options. Uh, uh, the more flooded it is, and most of these fish are spring spawners, so they'll be up, up shallow and easy to access. Um, uh, but yeah, you could literally catch anything down there. Bring all your rods. Okay. I, I, Evan, I'm, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to suggest that we turn off your sharing for now so that we can see you in the uh, full screen view. Here we go. And we have one more, I would say more a comment than a question right now uh, from Monta Hainer. And she was mentioning that a great way to access, because you mentioned a lot of these areas, you really need a boat. She said a great way to access them is to use a, 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 a service called Paddle Share, which has many locations. Yes, yep. So Paddle Share um, was, uh, is uh, kind of, you know, like the, the green or blue bikes you see on the corners in Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's kind of like a rent-a-kayak thing. They're in these giant metal cases uh, at several, very, a lot of city parks and county parks um, from Coon Rapids all the way through St. Paul, I think, for sure, Minneapolis. And you can roll up and uh, pay whatever and take a kayak and a paddle and a vest. Uh, you can hop in that and go down river to the next takeout point and pop it in whatever tube is down there. Um, with that, you uh, I think the premise of that is they usually put like the rental bike racks also close to there. So you, you park at the top, float down, and then you bike back up to your car. If you're going with friends, maybe you can have one of your friend's cars at the end. Um, but yeah, that's a great, easy, easy access uh, way to get to on, on the river. There's also um, a couple of guys who are renting kayaks now. Um, outside of paddle share um, and they're they're always sending people out so yeah okay well we may get some more questions on the zoom later but right now maybe we can turn it over to the the in-person audience there at the crooked pint and see if they have some questions and Evan, when you you probably know this but if they ask a question it might be better to repeat their question i will repeat it multiple times what about the water? <laughs> Water. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the water isn't pristine. The question was what, how's the water quality? Um, it's not pristine by any measure, but it's also a lot cleaner than we give it credit. Um, I've found stonefly hatches all the way through downtown Minneapolis. Um, and there's lots of mayflies and caddis and all these species have really low tolerance for pollution. Uh, the type of pollution you have uh, a lot of is heavy metals um, from runoff and then a lot of just physical litter um, and fertilizer and stuff. So it's not 
great, but it's not bad either. Um, a really cool uh, guy. I don't know if you're on Instagram, but if you ever are really into watershed data, his name is, um, uh, I'll, I can send it to you later, but he's a, a biologist for all these nonprofit wow. groups and he's out on all the major urban waterways taking water samples, oxygen levels, temperatures, um heavy metals and everything like that um when i'm waiting in downtown i do wear waiters <laughs> i wouldn't recommend wet waiting in there uh it's because there are lots of bits of of metal or plastic or whatever that you don't want to get cut on um especially uh, everything above downtown minneapolis is very is relatively very clean um i would say good question they do um, a good resource for finding maps is the Minnesota water trails um, so you can go on to Google or just the DNR website look up water trail maps and uh, they're basically just state designated rivers and um, yeah they have maps with launches, campsites, campgrounds, where rapids are, things like that. And they're all 100% free. Um, the National Park Service also was handing out these cool booklets at one point. I haven't seen them for a little bit, but if you go to their office in the Science Museum down in St. Paul, you can probably pick up a free map book as well from them. Nice, anything else from the peanut gallery? I got a super. Okay. All right. First one, like, as these dams go out, they're gonna, are they gonna stop dredging them? That's the first question. Yep. Yep. So uh, uh, they have already stopped. <clears throat> they've they've already stopped. Uh, so the question was two parter. Um, first is asking, what about the dredging? The dredging is already stopped because there's no more barge traffic up there. Um, it's still, you know, relatively deep. It's like a nine to fifteen foot drop. Um, but they're, they're not doing much maintenance work on that channelization anymore. Um, uh, but yeah, probably like what happens to it if the dams get removed? And it's kind of like the same questions for the Kinney Dam um, and all the sediment that gets in there. Um, that's kind of a cost thing where, where what are we going to do with all this sediment <laughs> once we get get these dams through. And I don't think there's a solid answer for, for where that sediment goes or anything like that yet. I think that's what these disposition studies are gonna look at for that removal. Um, yeah, for sure. All right, second question. Yep. Really the first one made reference yep. to full sink and yeah. I saw that in terms of gear for kind of like St. Paul industrial area. Yep. How about in general, you know, any kind of thoughts of folks are gonna go out there, what weight ride? What kind of line to bring that kind of stuff? Yeah, so type of type of gear to use for this section. Um, you can do it with a six to an eight weight rod for most of the uh, sucker species, bass, pike, bat, uh, those guys. Um, obviously, if you want to go for big pike or muskies or sturgeon or whatever, you're going to be getting into the 10 plus weight. Uh, but floating line for the most part is fine. Um, with leader, uh, these fish are not leader shy, so you can use 10, 15, 20 pound leaders and um, keep them on a little bit longer for sure. Uh, but yeah, I usually rock a six weight or an eight weight with floating line. Um, depending on the section and water levels, you, you can get away with an eight foot leader. If water's really high or if you're in a boat fishing the deep, cliff face eddies, those are really deep in those areas. Um, we've had to use up to 15 foot long leaders um, uh, just to get down there. And you just plop it and you let it sit and sink <laughs> to get, get through those strong eddy currents. Um, uh, it's basically, yeah, it's kind of like tight line fishing or Euro fishing from a, from a boat for catfish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, we can do it with big nymphs or streamers, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. They're just waiting for stuff to drift down for them. It's it's pretty remarkable. Um, 
they'll eat poppers, these fish. So in this section, especially the urban river through the working river, these fish have never seen a fly. They might have seen a few jerk baits or spinners or whatever, for sure night crawlers, but they have never seen a fly. Um, and, and to date, it's been really remarkable to see how aggressive these fish, how instantly, especially the bass, how, how hard they hit these flies. Uh, as soon as they hit the water, they're like, holy crap. <laughs> and they just move right. And it's with, with flies, we get the neutral buoyancy and a lot of movement, even when we're not manipulating. It. Um, so if you're a predatory fish who's lazy, you're seeing that that's an injured piece of food. Um, that's, that's an easy decision. Yeah. Nice. Anything else? Um, de depends a lot on water temps. Uh, this year we made it like through, I think almost late October this year, we were still catching bass and carp, um, in the downtown area. Um, you can, this, there's not any springs. So most of it's all frozen over right now. Um, uh, but yeah, you typically, we can start fishing at mid April through mid October, depending on temps and water, water levels. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're going to be targeting pike, walleye, muskies, they all have pretty sharp teeth. So I would recommend wire tippet for those guys. We're uh, dogfish. Dog dogfish have teeth too. And there are a few in there, especially down in the floodplains. Yep. You don't find a lack of fly movement, the wire? Um, uh, does wire inhibit fly movement? If you use uh, one of the snap clips um, or if you tie a, a non-slipping loop knot, that can help, um, but it will kind of mute the side to side a little bit. Um, so would you rather lose more flies? Or? That's the, would you rather lose more flies or not move so much? That's the eternal question right there. Or lose a the big, the big fish. Yep, that's why we do it, people. That's why we're all here. The pain and suffering of fly fishing. <laughs> What's that? Uh, in this section, I found um, the best color for the bass is white, olive, or black. Um, close second would be brown or rusty, kind of crayfishy. Yeah. Um, chartreuse, um, sometimes, not always. If you had a, a chartreuse and a white clouser, you could do pretty good, but I've not done great on all, all chartreuse flies. Yeah. Crazy. They get picky. Don't they know the saying, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use? Come on. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Jeez. So we do have a couple more questions from the Zoom crowd. Uh, Evan, Brian is wondering how the road salt runoff draining into the river affects the fishing in the early spring. Uh, that doesn't, I haven't found it affects them um, any more or less than the actual water temperature. Um, these fish are really hardy and they can survive some pretty intense pop, uh, pollution levels. Um, uh, they will seek out smaller tributaries or fresh, you know, cleaner water inflows for sure in the spring. Um, but I don't think it, it affects them as bad as it might a trout stream. Uh, these, these, especially like our, our carp and our suckers and gar and all those guys they've they've been around for since dinosaur times they've seen they've seen some stuff <laughs> okay and then we we have another question from from lee lee stowe and he says that out west there are people who run car shovels for the guides they move their vehicles to the takeout point do you know of any such thing on the mississippi there's a uh, Monticello shuttles. He does clear water to Elk River. Um, at this point, there aren't any shuttle services um, for this area, um, unless you rent from rent from one of those kayak rental businesses, um, um, or you do the paddle share and you got to bike your way back up. So, <laughs> otherwise, 
or yeah or exactly if you're just in your waiters you know um yeah at this point there's no i don't it's not a very lucrative business i don't think for just shuttles and this yeah it was just me it's just me just stick your thumb out there i'll give you a ride Any, anything else? North Shore for carp. Um, there are a handful in Canal Park in Duluth. Otherwise, I think the water is uh, too cold for carp in Lake Superior um, to do super well. Um, if you want to, like Lake Michigan, shallower, a lot shallower, more sandy, a little warmer, that has like epic carp fishing in it. Um, so any like Western Green Bay, Western Wisconsin, all that, uh, uh, the most famous place is Beaver Island, um, kind of at the tip of the mitten. That's, a, that's like carp heaven up there. Um, but yeah, I've not heard of a resounding carp in L Lake Superior yet, but I'm sure they're working on it. <laughs> Hopefully the silver carp don't get up there. That's why we're closing all these dams down so they don't get to the Great Lakes. Um, um, and that's another cost of the dam removal too. Dams do stop those things. Thankfully, uh, Taylor's Falls on the St. Croix, that's never going anywhere. And then St. Anthony Falls Dam is not going anywhere. So those are our hard lines. And the uh, DNR is doing a lot of fascinating work to try to stop those things. So. Uh, yeah. Why does the Army Corps want to get rid of the St. Anthony Falls Dam? Sure. So there's a major. Um, why? Why does the Army Corps want to get rid of the the St. Anthony Dam? Um, there is a major project that needs to be done on the. Um, I think it's called the breaking breaker wall, and that's like the concrete face on St. Anthony Falls. Um, at this point, it's in limbo who actually owns and who should maintain that breaker wall. The Army Corps for sure owns the lock there, but they're kind of like, eh, we're, we don't really own that thing. That's a Minneapolis thing. <laughs> Minneapolis, Minneapolis is like, no, that's more like a U of M thing or an XL power thing. Um, so uh, I think uh, because the dam isn't serving any use anymore for barge traffic, there's some major repairs on the slate and no one's really taking ownership of it. Um, the Army Corps is kind of trying to <laughs> shoo it off right now. Um, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see what shakes out from that here, probably by next spring or summer. Yeah. Dun, dun. So what happens? You're probably like, what happens to the breaker wall? So the breaker wall, um, all of the bedrock through there is all limestone, super easily eroded. Back in like 1869, St. Anthony Falls had this crazy collapse um, and it, it just, just eroded and collapsed. Um, and so they built this breaker wall to um, hold, <laughs> hold uh, the limestone together and keep the water off of the actual face of the, of the, of the limestone under there. Um, but that hasn't been maintained or anything for decades now, and it's way overdue. Um, uh, but uh, the original St. Anthony Falls 10,000 years ago was at the mouth of the Minnesota River, and over, over the millennia, it's eaten its way up the gorge and is where it is now. Um, pretty cool, but yeah. That's why <laughs> somebody somebody doesn't want to deal with a project that needs to be done. <laughs> any uh, any other questions? They, no, we're all going to make a line out there, and uh, what where will the the invasive carp go? We're all going to stand in a line. We'll all take turns. We'll just. Tell them no. Snipers. We're all going to have sniper <laughs> rifles up on top of the gorge. Yep. 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 Right. Yep. So the, 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 the hard stop is right at St. Anthony Falls. That's like 
never going to be taken out and never going to be opened again. Um, the other two dams, the Lower St. Anthony and the Ford, those are the ones that are slated to be taken out. Um, and so they're like, eh, yeah, if they're just doing two of the three down there. Yep, or maybe doing two of the three. Um, so they'll get up through the gorge probably. Um, I've not, you, 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 you look at these YouTube videos and they're all on super like slow, big rivers. They're not in like rapids and things like that. So if we took out those dams and restored the rapids, like up to, there's up to class three rapids underneath all these layers of, of silt now. Um, if we sped up that current, made different river bottom, would they be able to live in that? I don't know. Um, that's above my pay grade, but um, fascinating stuff. Fisheries management is crazy for sure. I uh, they've uh, where are the silver carp now? I think they're they found multiple of them in like Lake Pepin area. They might have just found one in like uh, the Prescott, very lower St. Croix there, but they haven't made it past in at least any survivable numbers past that area yet. Just gotta go fishing, put a net in there, just dredge it up, see what you find. Cool, well, looks like the chat slowed down. Anything else in here, team? Man, well, thank you so much again. This is awesome. And happy uh, holidays and happy trout opener here next weekend for Minnesota, January 1st. I think it's gonna be 40 degrees. You should get out there. Uh, get out early though before snow melt starts. Once that snow melt hits the water, then they all shut down. Um, but yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Evan. You had a lot of complimentary comments on the chat. Just a reminder to everybody uh, that we will be doing a drawing for a box of Paul Johnston's flies and the lucky winner. We'll be notified by email. So thanks for showing up on a uh, late December evening. Absolutely. Are we doing the drawing? Bob will do it. Oh, Bob will do we'll it. We're doing the drawing it. offline. It's, okay. it's, it's absolutely trustworthy, though. You guys can all trust me. <laughs> Not correct at all. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign off this Zoom meeting and let everybody get back to their evening and let the Crooked Pint folks maybe have one more pint. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Bob. See you, Bob. Thank you. Oh, you look at that. Whoa, sculpting. <laughs> That's cool. Coming at you. Dang. <laughs> Where